Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. President Trump is preparing to visit Dayton and El Paso on Wednesday. His trip will come as he faces pressure to move on gun control legislation. In New York today, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and Republican Congressman Peter King called on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to move forward with universal background legislation. That bill was passed by the Democrat-run House, but is stalled in the Republican-controlled Senate. Ohio's Republican Governor Mike DeWine voiced his support for so-called red flag laws that allow courts to temporarily seize a person's firearms if they're deemed a threat. He also advocated for increased background checks for gun purchases. The president will be visiting two towns mourning the loss of 31 people from mass shootings. The Democratic mayor of Dayton said she'll welcome President Trump in her official capacity, but also criticized his reaction to the shootings made this bet and he's got a lie in it, you know. Uh, he hasn't, you know, um, his rhetoric has been painful for many in our community. Uh, and I think that people should stand up and say they're not happy if they're not happy that he's coming. Look, I'm disappointed with his remarks. I mean, I think they fall fell really short. He mentioned, like, gun issues one time. Um, I think, you know, watching the president over the past few years on the issues of guns, he's been, um, I don't know if he knows what he believes, frankly. When the mayor of El Paso expressed a similar sentiment, as did the city's Democratic Congresswoman, Veronica Escobar. I hope that he has the self-awareness to understand that we are in pain and we are mourning and we are doing our very best in our typical, beautiful, graceful <coughs> El Paso way to continue to be resilient. And so I would ask his staff and his team to consider the fact that his words and his actions have played a role in this. It is shocking to me that he is so utterly self-aware. And this is why, from my perspective, he is not welcome here. He should not come here while we are in mourning. CBS News' Hillary Lane reports on the president's plans in El Paso. The details of the president's trip are being kept under wraps for security purposes, but we know he'll be here tomorrow afternoon. The White House says he'll visit the victims' families, he'll meet with the injured in the hospital, and thank first responders. Now, this trip is not without controversy. Presidential Democratic hopeful Beto O'Rourke, who's from El Paso, says the president should stay home. He blames the violence, the mass shooting that happened here at this Walmart in El Paso. He blames the president's what he calls a hateful rhetoric about immigrants. The president has talked about what he calls an invasion of migrants at the southern border. We know the shooter left a manifesto where he echoed some of President Trump's language. El Paso here is 80 percent Hispanic. But the mayor of El Paso says he was the one that invited the president. He says he felt an obligation to do so. But he did say that he has received angry calls, texts and letters from residents asking the president not to come. And there's a group here in El Paso called Border Network. They say they have a petition with 17,000 signatures telling the president to stay in Washington. Now, we've been speaking to people here who have been arriving all day. You can see a vigil behind me. People have been leaving flowers and cards for the victims' families of this shooting. There are very mixed opinions here. Some echo Beto O'Rourke sentiments. They do not want the president to come. They are Hispanic. They say they personally feel attacked by the president. Others welcome the president and say when this city has gone through so much tragedy, it's comforting to have the president of the United States here. In El Paso, Hillary Lane. Elaine, over to you. And joining me now, CBS News White House correspondent Weijia Zhang, Washington Bureau Chief for The Intercept, Ryan Grimm, and Daryl Johnson. He is a former terrorism analyst for the Department of Homeland Security. In 2009, Daryl authored a report on the resurgence of right-wing extremism. Thank you all for being with us. Weijia, this is not the first time that President Trump has faced opposition to visiting the site of a mass shooting. Last fall in Pittsburgh, he was met by protesters while visiting the Tree of Life Synagogue after 11 people were killed. Should we expect to see protests tomorrow?
Yeah, absolutely. Just like we saw from that report uh, on the ground, people are not welcoming him to El Paso. Uh, you're right. There have been instances before. In fact, any time we go uh, to one of these rallies that are filled with Trump supporters, there are always counter protests. Now, you can imagine why this one will be, um, you know, intensified by by so much because of the rhetoric that the president has used, especially in the past a few months in talking about about immigration reform and what he calls the crisis at the southern border, the invasion, uh, which he is not backing down from. And so um, I think people there really feel like, you know, he played a role in this, as we've heard from lawmakers, as we've heard from people who live there. And so even though the president is saying that he wants to unify, he wants to talk with people who live there, he wants to pray with them, uh, he wants to help heal, you know, it's really difficult, I think, for them to believe him, given everything else he has said about this community in particular. So we are certainly expecting protests. Now, how many people will mobilize is the question, because, again, they are mourning. Uh, they are uh, trying to, to deal with what has just happened to their community. And really, I think this could be a major distraction for them, whether they're going to, you know, turn that into movement and demonstrations is another story. But I do think that the law enforcement there is prepared. They know that people will be out in force, letting the president know that, you know, he's not welcome in their hometown. Well, so then, given that kind of atmosphere, Ryan, that we just laid out, what do you think the objective here is for the president in making these visits? Well, he's in a strange situation because the protocol is that the president, as the leader of the country, goes uh, to sites of disasters like this. You know, this is, this is the kind of thing that a president does, but he's not the kind of president that we've ever had before. And so he's, he's trying to play that role and he feels pressured into it. And, and you know, when he's told that he can't do something, you know, that, that also motivates him uh, to go and do it. But this, this is also going to color his entire presidential campaign. You know, the, 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 the spectacle of his rallies is going to take on a different hue uh, going forward. You know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be as funny. Uh, when, the, when they're, you know, cracking wise about shooting immigrants, uh, the, you know, the next time that somebody's uh, yelling that out in the audience and everybody's laughing along. And, you know, that some of that carnival atmosphere is, is going to uh, take on a much uh, a darker tone. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how that affects uh, rhetoric that we might hear on the campaign, tra uh, campaign trail. So, Daryl, you first warned of an increase in right-wing violence a decade ago at the beginning of the Obama administration. How different do things look now compared to when you were researching extremism in 2009? Yeah, so back in 2009, we were just on the beginnings of this uh, rise and ascent of right-wing extremism. So now, here we are 10 years later, uh, been a huge increase in group numbers. Uh, they've had 10 years to recruit. Uh, they've been radicalizing. We're having attacks with much more frequency, and the body counts are getting larger with each attack. And so we're in a very dangerous, uh, vulnerable position right now because we've neglected this problem now for 10 years. So in the Washington Post yesterday, Daryl, a former FBI supervisor who worked on terrorism cases said, quote, I think in many ways the FBI is hamstrung in trying to investigate the white supremacist movement like the old FBI would. There's some reluctance among agents to bring forth an investigation that targets what the president perceives as his base. It's a no-win situation for the FBI agent or supervisor. What do you make of the idea uh, about that, that, that it's a political kind of consideration that could be affecting how the FBI or how some FBI agents might think about their job? Yeah, in order to understand domestic terrorism, you need to understand that it's a minefield of divisive political and social issues here in America. We're talking about gun rights, abortion rights, uh, immigration, and other issues. And so that's why a lot of politicians uh, bury their heads in the sand and don't try to address this issue. I would also add to that comment that, you know, the backlash to my report actually sent a chilling effect throughout both the law enforcement community and the intelligence community because they saw what happened to me and my unit as well as what happened to my office, and they don't want to succumb to the same types of political pressure. So, Ouija, President Trump says that he wants to move forward with some form of gun control legislation. Do we know what he's considering?
Well, you know, when you talk to officials here um, at the White House about this, they have made the distinction that he wants to move forward with legislation that would reduce the threat of mass shootings. They're careful not to say explicitly uh, gun control, even though the president has indicated that he's willing and open to that. And that's because they don't want to be backed into some corner and have the president uh, walk away, as we've seen him do in the past. And so what is happening now here at the White House, Legislative Affairs is working with White House counsel to put those options on the table that the president outlined during his speech yesterday to see what uh, might be able to be accomplished with executive authority and what has to be done legislatively. Most of that will be the case, and Congress will have to be involved. Um, but right now, what we're lacking is any real meat and substance on these policy proposals. You know, the president has said he wants to reduce violence um, in, in video games, for example. He wants to really focus and build the case uh, for uh, mental illness and um, allowing there to be red flag laws, which would allow family members to petition authorities uh, for, for people who are at risk not to have firearms. He's talked about making sure the death penalty is on the table in cases of mass shootings. Um, but he didn't directly talk about gun control. Even though he tweeted about stronger background checks, he didn't talk about those background checks during his speech. And even though sources here say, look, that doesn't mean he's not considering them, that's the problem here, that the president himself hasn't been clear about what he would be willing to sign, what he would be willing to do. Because when you get into that territory of expanded background checks, you know, that's when he faces the most resistance uh, from his party, from the NRA, from his supporters. So in the meantime, Ryan, we've been seeing reports that younger members of the House Democratic Caucus are pushing Speaker Pelosi to bring representatives back to Washington to work on gun control. What are you hearing about this on Capitol Hill? Well, Democratic leaders uh, feel like, you know, they've done their job so far. You know, they, they've, they've passed legislation this session. They've been on uh, record in the past uh, for tighter uh, gun control legislation and so their their kind of initial reaction is hey you know this is not on us this is on Mitch McConnell this is on Republicans who are standing in the way they should pick up our bills and pass them and if we come back to Washington then it's going to look like we haven't haven't done our job but the, re the reality is that the public isn't ha didn't really see the legislation that they passed through the House as you know like like many of their other messaging bills they didn't get much coverage and part of that is because they're not terribly aggressive. They're not the they're not the kind of thing that the, that would kind of turn heads in the public. They're not looking to, um, you know, they're not looking at sweeping bans. They're mm -hmm. they're talking, you know, more background checks and and uh, the kind of more consensus. Uh, uh, gun legislation that's been kicked around for the last five or six years. Well, how does this divide the, uh, this week between leadership and some of the younger members of the caucus reflect what you've seen throughout this session of Congress? Well, it's this, you know, it's it's the same thing again. It's the mm -hmm. it's the younger members um, wanting wanting to go bolder and and not having the same fear that that Democratic leaders have. You know, in in 1994, a lot of Democrats were convinced that a major driver in the Republican revolution of that year of Newt Gingrich becoming Speaker of the House and them losing their 50-year majority uh, was the assault weapons ban. Was uh, you know Democrats getting too aggressive? On, uh, on gun legislation, and so th they feel like it's some type of a third rail, uh, but they're not recognizing, A, that there's a new generation that has, has lived through these shootings their whole life, and B, the party is not what it was. It, you know, there, there used to be a lot more rural Democrats. Now, Democrats are largely a party of, of cities and, and suburbs, and gun control is a winning issue in, in both cities and, and suburbs. Uh, and, and, Increasingly, uh, in in the suburbs that are now swinging rapidly uh, towards Democrats, and and this is only kind of hastening the realignment that Democratic leaders aren't quite grasping. So then, Daryl, what specific steps, though, do you want to see Congress actually take to combat right wing extremism? There's so many things that need to be done, uh, but it all starts with recognizing the threat and calling it terrorism when there's an ideology behind the violence. Until we recognize it and start calling it terrorism, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, have any type of strategy to combat it. All right. Weijia Zhang, Ryan Grimm, and Daryl Johnson, thank you all so much. Thanks.